I am indeed going to talk to you today about the future of self-tracking. And I think that the best way to anticipate the future is to fully understand the present. And I also believe that the best way to design useful tools is to notice and respect what people are already juggling in their lives. Um, and I also want to just share um, some new survey data. I actually have to bring my notes because we just got the survey data back on um, last week, and I haven't fully analyzed it. But I was inspired by this conference to put some of these questions into our national survey. So I want to share it with this group first before I've published any of it. Um, I'm going to start with um, someone who inspires me, Tom Ferguson. He was an MD who trained at Yale Medical School, but who actually never practiced medicine in the traditional sense. And uh, he forged a path that we now call participatory medicine. What Tom believed is that people's um, lives were a puzzle. And clinicians can't put that puzzle together for patients. Each person needs to figure out the contours of the pieces for themselves, and everybody has their own motivations, values, and experiences, some of which we share with our clinicians and some of which we don't. And what Tom believed is that each person um, should really come to a clinician uh, when they need a guide, when life intersects with medicine. But in general, people are, are really going ahead with their lives um, without the need for a doctor. Um, they just need a guide when they do need a doctor. Um, now, as you think about self-tracking and we, as we go through today, what I'd like everybody to do is think about how, um, how do the pieces of your puzzle fit together? Are there um, aspects of your life that you know well? Are there aspects of your life that you'd like to discover more about? Um, and are there aspects of your life that you actually um, keep secret? Are there pieces of the puzzle that you don't talk about, um, but that maybe you could benefit from understanding better? Um, as I actually talked with Larry about being the speaker for today, I thought at first maybe I wasn't the right person to be the opening speaker of a self-tracking symposium. I don't think of myself as a self-tracker. Um, I don't own a Fitbit or a Zio. I run, but I don't even track my mileage or my pace. I don't even own a scale. Um, but I realize that I am a self-tracker in one way, and that is, um, I keep a pair of skinny jeans in my closet. <laughs> and I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people have a pair of skinny jeans, right? So you're self-trackers right there. Um, but I realized that this is a really um, important emerging part of participatory medicine for people to really understand what's going on in their lives, to track it and to measure it, um, and make decisions about whether they're going to share it. And so I set out to take some measurements, which is what the Pew Internet Project um, it's what our role is, um, hopefully, in the industry. Um, so here it is, um, the first time that anybody's seeing the data. What we find is that 60% of U.S. adults are tracking their weight, diet, or exercise routine. One in three are tracking some other health indicator or symptom, which means um, we listed blood pressure, blood sugar, headaches, or sleep patterns as the example in the telephone survey. One in three caregivers track some health indicator or symptom for a loved one. Um, and we go through a whole series of questions defining caregivers. It is mostly people taking care of an adult family member, um, but we do include um, children, parents of children or caregivers of children who are facing significant life challenges. One in three are tracking their loved one's health indicators or symptoms. Um, now, putting all that all together, seven out of 10 American adults say they're a self-tracker. It's incredible, right? Half say they're keeping track in their heads. So these are my people. These are the skinny jeans people. So they are not necessarily using any of the tools that are available to them. They're just keeping track in their heads. One in three are using um, a notebook or a journal. They're using paper and pencil. 
and one in five are using an app, a website, a spreadsheet, some other tool. Um, and uh, I think that there's an opportunity here just to recognize what people are actually doing. Um, when we ask them, um, how often do you track? Do you track regularly? Um, half said they track on a regular basis. Um, and that's, that's everybody. When I talk about self-trackers, I'm talking about everybody. Half say they track on a regular basis. And the other half track only when something comes up. Um, something triggers the need to track. Um, and we also found that people... Um, so, so one of the things that, that I looked at this data and thought, how are we going to create tools that are as easy as keeping track in your head? How are we possibly going to compete with the ease of um, paper and pencil? So that's one of the challenges that I wanted to bring today. The reality of where people are and the hope of where people could be. Um, one thing that we do in our health surveys is ask people whether they're currently living with a chronic condition, and we list um, lung condition, heart condition, high blood pressure, um, cancer, and then we have a catch-all, any other health condition, also diabetes. Um, and I took a look at the data um, of people who are living with two or more chronic conditions. 62% of adults living with two or more chronic conditions um, say they're self-tracking and they're self-tracking that health indicator or symptom. Um, this is the kind of data that you can use to map the frontier of health and healthcare. This is the kind of data that can tell you where things are headed if you understand what's happening in the present. Now, I often call myself an internet geologist because I actually don't, um, I, I try not to give my personal opinion. I'm just telling you the lay of the land so that you can understand, so that you can build something that lasts. Don't build your house on sand. Build it on bedrock. Understand the patterns of technology use and adoption so that you can track where people are going, so that you can lay down paths where people are already walking. Um, but it's also important to keep asking those wonderful what-if questions. Um, and I wanted to highlight my friend Carol Torgan's um, Pinterest board. Um, she's created this amazing resource, which is all sorts of wearable tech. And so, you know, you ask, what if a hospital gown? could be made of smart material? What if your skinny jeans could give you more feedback than just that they pinch in certain places? Um, and so I, I would just urge you to um, pair that kind of imaginary, um, amazing possibility with the data that I'm sharing with you today. So it, uh, the future is here. Um, what is the most common form of wearable tech? How many people have a cell phone within reach right now. 85% <laughs> of US adults own a tracker. And that's actually what I'm calling my cell phone now, uh, because that's really what it is. It's a tracker. 43% um, of cell phone owners have downloaded an app of any kind. And this is the Pew Internet Project data um, that you, you might be familiar with our health data, but you should also look at um, the data that we study in other sectors. Um, my colleague Aaron Smith covers politics, and he and I find that we actually have the most in common in terms of looking at how people are using the Internet. The social impact of the Internet on politics is actually pretty similar to the social impact to the internet on health. Um, so some data that pertains to um, general app use that I thought would be important for this group. 54% of app users have decided to not install a cell phone app when they discovered how much personal information they would need to share in order to use it, 54%. 30% of app users have uninstalled an app that was already on their cell phone because they learned it was collecting personal information they didn't wish to share. That was a puzzle piece that they wanted to hide, that they wanted to keep to themselves. And it's something to keep in mind. The latest survey data, the 2012 survey data, shows that health app use is flat 
we have not seen an increase. We measured it in 2010, 2011, 2012. It's still just at one in 10 cell phone users has a health app. In this survey, we asked people in an open-ended question, what kind of health app do you have? And then we categorized them. It's not very surprising to see that exercise, fitness, diet, food, and weight are the most popular. Um, so I actually called um, David Kirkhoff of uh, Weight Watchers and asked him about the success of the Weight Watchers app. They've had 10 million downloads of their app. Um, and he told me about how they really struggled starting in the Palm Pilot era, which, how many people had a Palm? That was my favorite. I loved the Palm. But, um, but they just couldn't find a way um, to, to make apps that could really work with any platform until the iPhone came along. And he said the key is that it's integrated. It's not just a standalone app. It's integrated with their website, and it's integrated with the in-person support group. And that it spells the success of the Weight Watchers app. So I wanted just to pause and think about this for a minute. Think about what I've described so far. We have this huge group of American adults who are struggling with obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, who could benefit from self-tracking. We, we have the studies to show that self-tracking can really turn things around for people. We also have a big group of people who are doing self-tracking or think they're doing self-tracking. So they're primed. These are the sleeper cells that you might be able to wake up. And then we have this huge group of people the vast majority of American adults who own a tracker, who own a cell phone, but we still have very small uptake for the health apps and any technology that would help somebody track. So how are we going to bring these huge groups into this area and possibly grow it? Should it be our goal that we have 100% self-tracking among those people who have two or more chronic conditions? Should, should that be a goal? Um, and if so, how are you going to get there? Um, so I wanted to just point out that last slide, um, because even as we're talking about the vast majority of Americans and what we're dealing with, and talking about the patterns in the landscape that you should check out, also keep an eye out for the pioneers. Um, my favorite group in our survey, there was a small group of men who have a menstrual cycle app on their phone. <laughs> it's a, it was a significant group. Um, so why would a man be tracking a woman's menstrual cycle? I could think of a few reasons. Um, one is for fertility. Um, you know, if you are trying to make a baby, then make sure that you don't schedule a business trip when um, the woman is fertile, or if you're trying to avoid making a baby. Um, the other reason why someone might be tracking uh, menstrual cycles, um, maybe there could be a trigger to bring home chocolates on a certain day. Um, and if that doesn't exist, may I make that suggestion? Um, so now this is just for the ladies. Um, of course, most of us track our menstrual cycle. It's something that we're expected to do. We don't talk about it a lot. Um, but how many of you have arrived at your annual exam without immediately being able to fill out the date of the first day of your last period? I've done that. And they're so mad at you. They're exasperated um, because this is self-tracking that they expect you to do, and they're annoyed if you haven't kept good records and are not ready to share it right away with them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the data that we collected about sharing. Um, now, this is Katie McCurdy's medical timeline, which we'll hopefully hear more about. Um, and we did find, um, so we asked people, do you share your self-tracking records or notes with anyone, online or offline? And one-third say yes, they share, and the vast majority share offline. Two-thirds do not share. Um, of those who share, Half say that they share their self-tracking notes with a clinician, and the other half share with a family member, friend, or member of a group. Um, now, what does that tell you about clinical engagement with self-tracking? How many clinicians are aware that so many people are self-tracking, which is one of the reasons why I'm excited to bring the survey data out to the public. Um, are clinicians maintaining a don't ask, don't tell policy about self-tracking? Um, because they, they're not ready to take it in. Their medical records aren't ready to take it in. They're not ready to hear it. Um, or um, is it that 
you know, we look at the two thirds of people who are self tracking who are not sharing. Is this part of life's puzzle that they want to keep secret? Um, that is really is just for their own self-discovery that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the clinical encounter. It's something to remember as you're designing tools about whether people want to share thinking back again to the folks who uninstalled an app because it was sharing too much information and thinking about what people's motivations might be um, for sharing. Um, now, one of the first lessons that I learned from Tom Ferguson was to never assume that I knew what to ask respondents. <laughs> And he was the one who encouraged me to start doing field work in patient communities and to listen to patients so that we could have more astute survey questions. Um, and he drove that lesson home by giving me a book um, by the anthropologist Diana Forsyth, Studying Those Who Study Us. And in one chapter, she describes how in the 1990s, she did field work in an artificial intelligence lab. And the lab was tasked with creating a information kiosk. Remember, it was the 90s. They were tasked with creating an information kiosk for newly diagnosed migraine patients. But the AI guys made a fatal error. They did not ask any patients what they wanted to know. They did an interview with a single neurologist about what he thought patients should know. And therefore, when the kiosk launched, it was a failure. Um, and what they found is that the kiosk did not answer the number one question of people diagnosed with migraine, and that is, am I going to die? Am I going to die from this pain? And that question seems silly to a neurologist. And I love this quote. The research team simply assumed that what patients wanted to know about migraine was what neurologists want to explain. Let's learn from that. Let's notice what patients are doing. Let's understand that there are secret pieces of our lives that we might not feel comfortable asking a clinician, but people might feel comfortable asking a search box on a screen. Um, now, the parallel for me um, when I was looking at this is um, Google or any search box. How many of us have asked a secret question of Google? Something that we're really not sure that we should ask a clinician or, or even ask a friend, but we're curious about. Um, I think that that is important to notice, that, that people have these secret fears, um, and they want to find out what's going on in their lives. And the intimacy of a blank search box, especially on a mobile device, is something that I think is very powerful. Um, as Diana Forsyth has taught us, there is so much potential for greatness. There is so much potential for impact on people's lives if we can design for what could be. Um, the Pew Internet Project and California Healthcare Foundation survey asked people about the impact of self-tracking on their lives. And I'm gonna close with these numbers because I think they represent what is. These are the self-trackers who are doing this under the radar without a lot of encouragement necessarily. And this is the impact that they're seeing. And then I'll show you another image of what could be. 34% of self-trackers say their data collection has affected a health decision. 40% of self-trackers say it's led them to ask a doctor new questions or seek a second opinion. 46% of self-trackers say it's changed their overall approach to health. These numbers just amazed me because what we're seeing is the impact of self-tracking, the potential for bringing this to more American adults and allowing them to have the self-discovery that can have a real impact on their health. Now, we're going to hear today from people um, who've put together the puzzle pieces in their lives in new ways because of self-tracking. Um, 
I already showed you Katie's um, self-tracking medical timeline. And another person who engaged in self-tracking and made a really significant health change is Mike Wilson. Is Mike in the house? I can't see. Um, well, I would just love to have a round of applause for Mike Wilson, who, through self-tracking, um, has been able to lose a significant amount of weight. And this is the impact that we're all talking about today. So congratulations to Mike. And stay tuned for um, a full report on this. I'm hoping to release it in December. Thank you.